Hey guys, um, prior to my obligatory unscripted rant, uh, angry rant, about the miscarriage of justice which was carried out today in um, Scotland against well, my friend and yours, Count Dankula, I thought I'd offer something a little bit different. This is sort of a reimagining of a plea for free speech in Boston. It was originally written by Frederick Douglass in 1860, but I think with a few tweaks it's rather applicable here. Scotland is a great country, and Glasgow has a fame almost as extensive as that of Scotland. Nowhere more than here have the principles of human freedom been expounded. But for the circumstances already mentioned, it would seem almost presumption for me to say anything here about those principles. And yet even here, in Scotland, the moral atmosphere is dark and heavy. The principles of human liberty, even I correctly apprehended, find but limited support in this hour of trial. The world moves slowly, and Scotland is much like the world. We thought the principle of free speech was an accomplished fact. Here, if nowhere else, we thought the right of people to assemble and to make and laugh at jokes as they pleased was secure. Billy Connolly had defended the right. Frankie Boyle had practically asserted the right, and Count Dankula had maintained it with steadiness and fidelity to the last. But here we are today, contending for what we thought we gained years ago. The mortifying and disgraceful fact stares us in the face that though Glasgow Green and Wallace Monument stand, freedom of speech is struck down. No lengthy detail of facts is needed. They are already notorious, far more so than will be wished ten years hence. The world knows that this Tuesday a trial finally assembled to discuss the question, is a joke about a Nazi dog a prison-worthy offense? The world also knows that the trial was delayed, corrupted, orchestrated by a mob of feckless government officials, and thereafter used to silence a private citizen by the order of the Crown who refused to liberate the defendant, though called upon to do so. If this had been a mere outbreak of religious fundamentalism and jihad among the baser sort, maddened by fervor and hounded on by some wily imam to serve some immediate purpose, a mere exceptional affair, it would have likely been ignored or even approved by polite society. But the comedian now convicted is a gentleman. He is a man who prides himself upon a respect for human rights and edgy jokes. These government men brought their respect for freedom and equality with them in name only, and proclaim it loudly while in the very act of violating that very freedom. Theirs was the law of censorship and outrage. The law of free speech and the law for the protection of edgy jokes they trampled underfoot while they greatly magnified the laws of censorship and outrage. The scene was an instructive one. Men seldom see such a blending of the faux civil actor with the censorious authoritarian goon as was shown on this occasion. It proved that authoritarianism is very much the same, whether in a powdered wig or 1930s Hugo Boss. Nevertheless, when government officials and journalists approach us in the character of lawless and censorious authoritarians, assuming for the moment their manners and tempers, they have themselves to blame if they are estimated below their quality. No right was deemed by the fathers of comedy more sacred than the right of speech. It was in their eyes, as in the eyes of all thoughtful men, the great moral renovator of society and government. Bill Hicks sarcastically called it a wacky concept when addressing religious outrage. Liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions or make innocent jokes on the internet has ceased to exist. This, of all rights, is the dread of tyrants. It is the right which they first of all strike down. They know its power. Thrones, dominions, and courtrooms, and universities, and principalities, and powers founded in injustice and wrong are sure to tremble. If men are allowed to reason of righteousness and humor, temperance, and of a judgment to come in their presence, 
Totalitarianism cannot tolerate free speech. Five years of its exercise would banish the information ministry and break the back of the censor's board. They will have none of it there, for they have the power. But shall it be so here? Even here in Scotland and among the friends of freedom, we hear two voices. One denouncing the conviction of Count Dankula on Tuesday as a base and cowardly outrage. And another depreciating and regretting the creation of such a joke by such a man at such a time. We are told that the joke was offensive and the parties to it criminals as a result. Why? What was the matter with it? Are we going to palliate and excuse a palpable and flagrant outrage on the rights of speech by implying that only a particular brand of humorous ought to exercise that right? Are we at such a time when a great principle has been struck down to quench the moral indignation which the deed excites by casting reflections upon those who make the jokes in the first place. After all the arguments for liberty to which Glasgow has listened for more than a century, has she yet to learn that the time to assert a right is the time when the right itself is called into question, and that the men of all others to assert it are the men to whom the right has been denied? It would be no vindication of the right of speech to prove that certain gentlemen of the correct politics, eminent for their abilities to sniff out outrage for political purposes, are allowed to freely express their opinions on all subjects, including the subject of censorship. Such a vindication would need itself to be vindicated. It would add insult to injury. Not even an old-fashioned free speech rally could vindicate that right in Glasgow just now. There can be no right of speech where any man, however lifted up or however humble, however young or however old, or however edgy or however tame, is overawed by force and compelled to suppress his honest sentiments or sense of humor. Equally clear are the rights to hear and to laugh. To suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those of the speaker. It violates the rights of the audience as well as the comic. It is just as criminal to rob a man of his right to speak and hear and joke and laugh as it would be to rob him of his money to pay for such a sad excuse of a legitimate conviction. I have no doubt that the UK will vindicate this right, but in order to do so, there must be no concessions to the enemy. When a person is allowed to speak because he is progressive or sensitive in his politics, it aggravates the crime of denying the right to the brash and satirical. The principle must rest upon its own proper basis. And until the right is accorded to the humblest as freely as it is to the most exalted or progressive citizen, the government of Scotland is but an empty name, and its freedom a mockery. A man's right to speak does not depend upon what he wishes to say or joke about. The simple quality of manhood is the solid basis of that right. And there, let it rest forever.